and uh, Bryce and Sam Van Gundy, that's right, isn't it? Junior. Junior, okay, <laughs> is with us today, a naval aviator. He was uh, he's had thousands of hours of experience, and he's going to tell us about his experience in uh, World War II and later and his career in the uh, Navy. You are born around here somewhere in Logan County, and what happened? Yes, I was born in uh, Sterling, Colorado, and uh, grew up on a ranch out in Pawnee out here, and uh, always was interested in aircraft, and uh, somebody gave me a book, We, about Charles Lindbergh, and I was hooked for life as far as aviation is concerned. And uh, to approach the military, uh, oh, when Pearl Harbor happened, I was had gone a year and a half to Fort Collins State uh, College, and uh, I had a year and a half of, uh, of education, but they weren't taking the Navy uh, cadets uh, until they got a, a degree. That was in uh, December of of uh, 41. At this uh, time, why I hitchhiked with another buddy of mine by the name of Peyton Bre Breckenridge, and we uh, went down to Mobile, Alabama and went to work for the Southern Craft Paper Corporation. Stayed there for uh, for six months and got too hot, came back home, saw Junior Chairs, uh, one of the young fellows here who was in the uh, Navy recruiting office in Sterling, and I said, uh, Junior, I want to fly. What do I do? And he says, Come see me. Well, they sent me to San Francisco, and I was for the examining board, and I was sworn in and uh, in San Francisco, and returned, sent back to Sterling, Colorado, and uh, wait for a CPT uh, program. CPT at the time. Uh, Civilian pilot training, and uh, it was a good place to start. And they flew Cubs, and I flew that, and an Aronica Chief. Uh, then they sent us home when we finished there, and then uh, went to uh, Monterey, California, to the hotel. Now, you took the J3 training in Denver? In Denver, in the north part of Denver, an airfield there. Okay. And how, how much time did you spend there? I mean, how much time, how many hours did you put in those little planes? I don't remember uh, entirely, but it was probably about 20. 20 hours. So you yeah. kind of got your, you just got kicked off, and then then they booted you out to Monterey. To Monterey, and uh, it was an old uh, Del Monte Hotel, and it looked pretty grand when we marched up the road and uh, on a Sunday night and thought this is going to be great. We didn't get a chance to look at it for another three months. We were so busy giving us pre-flight training and uh, boot camp and so forth. So anyway, uh, graduated there and went to uh, Norman, Oklahoma. Now, were, were you given a commission there? No, we were known as aviation cadets and a seaman second class. Okay, so you yeah. hadn't got any uh gold stripes or anything at that time? No, none. <laughs> none, okay. <laughs> uh, Monterey, or, uh, Norman, Oklahoma was pretty interesting with the uh, the steerman, and we have a picture of it here, we'll show you later. Okay. And uh, then there was an airplane called Tim's, and uh, it was a low wing, that was the first low wing where the uh, steerman had been a uh, by wing and uh, anyway, there was about 100 hours there in uh, Norman, Oklahoma. And from there, went to Corpus Christi, Texas. Corpus Christi, Texas was uh, uh, an intermediate step towards advanced. And we flew uh, the Volte Vibrator, uh, Volte aircraft, and uh, it was a pretty good airplane. I always remark going out Highway 14 here, there's an electric shop out there that has two wings, and that, those two wings were apparently the uh, SNV, Volte Vibrator, and I always think about it every time I go by it. Then was, the, the, was the Vibrator the real name of the plane, or did you no, guys was, just, you just a, named it that? That was a nickname. It was an SNV, Volte. And, uh, but it was a rough riding rascal, huh? Yeah, well, it was, and it had wooden wings, and uh, 
very interesting. Uh, from there, uh, in Corpus Christi, we went to an outlying field, a uh, cabinous field, and then back to Mainside and uh, for instruments and uh, instrument flight training, and uh, then went to Waldron Field, which was out on the near the beach. And uh, now, let me. Uh, uh, so when you had instrument training, tell me, tell uh, tell us a f about a few of the instruments. You didn't have a lot of fancy electronic instruments in those planes, isn't that right? They they were pretty basic. Every time I turned around, I was an instrument instructor, and uh, for night fighters, and that was my primary job during World War II. And we have a picture of the F6, F5N, uh, 5N, 5N meaning night and radar, and it was very. Uh, I would say juvenile, very, uh, uh, it didn't really give you much of a chance, but, uh, and it vibrated like uh, the Dickens, and uh, we trained uh, F6, F5N uh, pilots, and then they were sent to the, that were sent on to the fleet. And uh, I stayed in two squadrons there, mainly, for the most part. And uh, then we had order. I had orders to uh, go to uh, photo pilot school in Pensacola, and this was in the early 1945 because I had received my wings in 44, January 44, and then been an instructor pilot, instrument instructor pilot, uh, almost the entire time. Well, I was uh, my uh, orders read go to. Uh, school at Pensacola and become a an, uh, photographic officer and photographic pilot. And we were halfway through the, well we finished that and we're halfway th through the uh, follow up on it and be checked out in the F6F again. And uh, for, for duty outside the continental limits of the United States is the way it kept reading. And uh, then they dropped the atomic bomb and the war was over uh, after about three months. But it was uh, it was very interesting uh, you know, how the development. I later figured out I was scheduled for the invasion of Japan in November of 1945. Of course, the war was over then, and and then I got out and uh, returned to Sterling, Colorado, and. Uh, Worked uh, in the cattle business in uh, north of Kersey or south of Kersey, and then back here and worked for Stickney's, and then uh, Korea came along, and I came went. I was a reserve ensign at the time when that happened, and I became an, a J, lieutenant JG. Were you just an ensign all the time that you were in the uh, when you were training pilots and stuff like that? Well, uh, when I got my wings, I became a, an ensign. Okay. Wings in January of '44. Okay. And. Uh, and then the war was pretty much over before you got your next. Uh, well, it was uh, '44, all of '44, and uh, half of '45. So. Right. And I was an instrument instructor most of that time. Okay. Yeah, and I. Uh, was out and then Korea came along and I volunteered and went back on active duty and later went to a regular, became a regular officer. And uh, guess what? Again, I ended up as an instrument instructor for uh, <laughs> guys going to, to uh, Korea. And uh, I was in that squadron and it became a regular fighter squadron. We were in the Air Defense Command, so I was, I was in Hawaii the training and then in San Diego was uh, air defense uh, squadron and uh, I like to be it and I like to say the unit I was in was uh, received a Navy unit citation and uh, we were the squadron was on hand and I was again off an instrument instructing and checking out fellows for the the uh, portion of Fighter Town, USA. And uh, so what does that mean, Fighter Town, USA? Well, that's an expression that a lot of the fighter pilots used to use at, uh, uh, around the area of uh, uh, 
San Diego, and because there was North Island and uh, there was Miramar and a couple of others there. There were training strips for... Uh, well, for we flew uh, the uh, F-3D. I was uh, in the fighter squadron, and uh, the squadron was present in uh, down in Florida when uh, the, I like to say that it was the day that Khrushchev blinked when the missile critical things happened in the squadron I was in, which was flying F-3Ds. F meaning fighter, three, and D Douglas aircraft build, and then it was a night fighter, and uh, but I was uh, behind the guns then. And uh, from uh, that portion, we uh, used to intercept the people that uh, were coming into the United States that had mixed, messed up on their uh, description of location and so forth where they would penetrate. And we would go out and intercept them and find out who they were and whatnot. And it was very interesting. When you say you intercepted them, you mean, were you doing aerial interception? Or aerial interception. People uh, trying to fly into the United States, was yeah, that it? Yes. Sometimes it would be an airline, sometimes it would be a, a military aircraft. Oh, they'd show up on... Uh, radar or something like that, you guys would scramble up and uh, right. and pick them off or try to escort them where they're supposed to go, is that it? Right, off the ground and within three minutes from the time that... And they intercept around the southern part of the United States. And uh, anyway, I enjoyed that portion of it and uh, from there I went to... Uh, oh, I became a regular officer instead of reserve. And I was... Uh, a lieutenant then in the United States Navy. And then they got orders to go back to uh, Washington, D.C. to the Photo Interpretation Center. And that became uh, interesting, and uh, I had several opportunities I won't discuss right now, but uh, to be uh, uh, involved and uh, in the Photo Interpretation Center. And then I went to a place, back to Monterey, to what was now Lion School, to bring everybody up to snuff. So, oh. not, let me understand, the reason you don't want to discuss the, the photo stuff is that's classified or yes. still considered kind of, Yeah, so we run into that all the time. That's about the third or fourth interview we've done with guys, and they, they think they're still under classified uh, uh, story. They've been told it's classified, and I guess they just don't talk about it. Huh? Just don't talk about it. Yeah, okay, that's fine. Uh, later on, uh, oh, then I went to uh, the heavy attack portion of of uh, this uh, world, and I flew an uh, A3D, an attack by Douglas, and it was a uh, it carried the big one in the back in the bomb bay. Big bomb. Yeah, and uh, I was on a made a cruise to Westpac in. Uh, 1961 and was gone from uh, April until uh, December, or uh, yeah, December 7th. I came back in again. And now, Westpac means Western West, Pacific. West, yeah, right. Whenever okay. we'd go out there, every time I turned around, I was going back to Westpac. And they were talking about some of these fine uh, uh, things that have happened. Uh, anyway, it was highly interesting, and uh, I uh, cringe sometimes when I see a picture of uh, some of the places that were our, were our targets at that time. A lot of people don't realize that uh, we're still under the MAD defense portion in the United States. MAD meaning mutual assured destruction. And the promise is, if you kill me, I'll kill you or I will already have launched a missile that will kill you. And then today we don't have any way of stopping even the first missile. Right. Of, uh, from uh, somebody who might not like us, and I probably better be careful where I step from now on. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> well. But, uh, so, so you were in the Westpac, and Westpac 
Were you, was that, uh, was that uh, fighting duty or did you fly uh, sorties or what happened there? Well, they were in, uh, there was three carriers when we were in the uh, 60s, early 60s. And I was on Bonhomme Richard at the time in the air group. And the air group is fr different from the ship's company. They're two separate things, but they work together. Right. And uh, uh, I don't know what else to say. Anyway, the three carriers uh, there was uh, could go into uh, upgraded status for launch to go into different targets and so forth, whether they anywhere in the Western Pacific and. Uh, I better step aside from that for now. I was uh, had to spend an, uh, quite a bit of time on uh, Bonhomme Richard, and I made a cruise on the USS Constellation. Well, that's kind of interesting because today the USS Constellation is one of our uh, ships that is going out there all the time, and it was constructed in 1961 or 60. 40 years ago. And it's still there, and about uh, a year and a half ago, I was in San Diego, and I went aboard Constellation in port there. They were allowing it at the time. And I made the first A3D landing aboard the uh, USS Constellation. And Really? Yeah, everything you did then was was uh, a first. Right. The guy behind me missed the wires, and he made the first boulder. Boulder <laughs> meaning we had to go around. And... Uh, uh, I came back from uh, California visit uh, in January, and uh, there was a uh, yeah, the, the young lad said they just returned again, and they were getting the constellation ready to go to another West Pack cruise. And the Kitty Hawk is a sister ship. They made them out of the same blueprints, and uh, I ended up in. Uh, ship's company on the USS Hancock. And uh, Hancock uh, was a World War II carrier that had been modified and put in an in angled deck. Yeah, well, it was, yeah. Had been installed in steam catapults. And uh, I ended up in ship's company. I was the aircraft handling officer. And I made a cruise uh, as handling officer. And uh, I was responsible for uh, all the handling of the aircraft while they were on deck, and responsible for the arresting gear, responsible for the uh, catapults. And I flew some, uh, but it was greatly restricted then I was because I was on ship's company. And uh, then I uh, went out in uh, 60, well, I'd been out in 61, and then uh, 62 was on the Constellation. 63, I was uh, the aircraft handling officer at 64 and 5. And I was in uh, Vietnam waters when Vietnam started in uh, January or February of uh, 65. Okay. So I, and then I came back to, uh, after they finished that cruise, in about uh, June of uh, 65, and then they sent me to a place called China Lake, which is a Navy research and lab, so forth. And some of the things that were developed there in 68, they're still having the, in the fleet. Modified many times, but uh, uh, very interesting to see. Where's China Lake? Well, it's north of Edwards Air Force Base, and it's in the Owens Valley, and the and uh, the Navy has a place, uh, two uh, areas in which they can, it's about 40 miles long, and maybe that wide, and they could uh, fire missiles or whatever in there. And uh, What state's that in? California. Yeah, okay. And the Owens Valley and Mount Whitney is nearby, and, and uh, Death Valley is over two, two valleys from Two China. valleys over. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So anyway, uh, and I was flying research stuff then, and which was really interesting, and I really got a kick out of it, and felt like I was doing some good. 
and I had made uh, commander aboard ship on the last cruise out there, and uh, I was the assistant air boss, as they called him, assistant air department. Then you were in the tower and running the airplanes after they left the deck, and uh, assigned targets and so forth, and uh, that was highly interesting. And well, now was that in the Vietnam War? In the Vietnam War, yes, it was. Yeah, so you were in Vietnam too. I was in Vietnam. Yeah. And uh, did you get in Korea? Did you go to Korea? Well, I ended up in Korea. Going, oh boy, I'm going to go out there, and I'm really going to give them what for back to teaching them how to fly. Well, you got, you're, you're doing instruction again. Yeah. In the forward area. Obviously, I, you were. A, you know, see, my my experience talking to people is that. People like yourself uh, had extra special qualifications, and that's why they like to keep you around to do these uh, special little jobs. Uh, things that maybe not so violent, but uh, really important. So yes. yeah. Well, I had some very interesting uh, uh, things that uh, that were made at the Michelson lab. That's quite a place. Michelson was a guy. That Figured out the speed of light, but right. uh, anyway, uh, it was it was okay, and I liked it there. And I have had some interesting uh, situations happen there, which I won't mention at this time. <laughs> <laughs> All classified. Well, no, not really. I went as a became a rock hound, as you might say, out there, a guy. That, was a friend of mine, and we went uh, into the bottom of uh, the Owens Valley and then the Panamint Valley, and we're in the bottom of the uh, Death Valley, and there's a ranch house up there. And he and I were in there at a certain period of the year, and, and uh, I'm on the, in the China Lake Mountain Rescue Group, and I'm a life member, and uh, we went to this place, and uh, we didn't go clear in, but we left and went back to China Lake uh, operations. And two weeks later, the sheriff of the county uh, wanted to uh, borrow our helicopters, which they were always wanting to use our helicopters to find lost people and this, that, and the other. And uh, they went in and they picked up Charles Manson. So I was there. Oh, really? I feel I was lucky that I was out of there. Yeah, you, you didn't. You, yeah, you didn't. <laughs> the Lord was watching. Wasn't he was it? watching me. So I've been at a very lucky career in the. I retired in 1970. And you were a commander? Commander of the United States Navy. Yeah. Retired. Right. Retired. <laughs> R-E-T. Uh -huh. So tell, uh, how many carrier landings would you guess you made? 155. Yeah, 150. Wow. That's I made 100 of them all on the uh, USS Bonhomme Richard. And uh, the, you qualified to become a centurion, it was called, 100 landings. Uh, Anyway, it was interesting. One interesting thing is I followed only, uh, mine wasn't quite as uh, vigorous a career, but uh, Stan Winsey, who lives here, and uh, right. he, he was a fighter pilot and flew F-6Fs uh, down in that area, Philipp Battle of Philippine Sea and so forth. I don't know, he, he really, uh, was exposed or else he was cycling down and uh, they battle of the uh, Philippine Sea or the Marianas Turkey shoot we shot down 408 Japanese airplanes right. Stan could tell you a little more about that we, we talked to Stan that was did yeah. he mention it well yeah we've got a lot of information he's a little he's bashful about it but that, yeah that was a that was a big operation oh yes. So anyway, uh, I flew, uh, the last airplane I flew was the A-6 Intruder, which is a real, real aircraft and very capable for anything you wanted it to do. No, it, it's a single engine. No, it was a twin engine. Twin. Uh-huh. Had the probe sticking up in the middle like that for in-flight refueling and stick it in the basket and oh. transfer fuel. All right. And what kind of engines on that? Jet engines. Jets, okay. 
And uh, now the aircraft uh, they're using, going after is the F-18. And it's a strike fighter, not a strike airplane itself, but it's a for strike attack and for fighter for intercepts or anything like that. And uh, we need uh, aircraft. We need aircraft, airplane parts, and we need them bad. That's this present assessment. Yes. That's what your people tell you. Yes. So do you think, uh, aside from your career, I mean, I know you watch this all the time personally and are very interested. In what's your opinion? This is 19, this is 2000 we're in. What's, what's your opinion of our preparedness from a air, not only air, but kind of a general military preparedness in the United States? Would you say we're up, down, in the middle? We're as bad off as we can be and still be here. Yeah, you think we need more? Food. We need more airplanes. We need more airplane parts. We need a better pay scale for the pilots and the military. Yeah, the military is losing pilots like everything. Yeah. So, uh, I don't know what else more to say. What about general preparedness? You got any opinion about that? Well, we're not really ready because some of those aircraft carriers are coming back in. I don't know what the how many crewmen there are on there, but uh, they're turning them around early so they don't get to spend any time at home to speak of. And, uh, well, they're just turning them around early and they're sending them to 2C without a full complement. That's what I understand. All 40%. Uh-huh. Somebody told me that. You didn't tell me that. Somebody no, did. somebody else told okay. me. Told you that. Uh, I don't That's, know. I mean, here we are in the middle of the United States, but I hear us funny things like that. Yeah. So uh, so you 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 then retired from the Navy after how many years, Sam? Well, I what was, was 28 your, years. 28 Count, years? Counting my reserve time and my regular duty time. Wow, okay. So, uh, and then, then you said you went into... Then after that, did you go... Uh, were, was that when you were in the cattle business and doing all that sort of stuff? No, that was the first time. First time, I, okay. Yeah. That was, then I then went, you went back in and stayed in. And I ended up uh, as an appraiser of businesses and housing and so forth. Sure. Okay. Would you, uh, do you think you had a satisfactory uh, life in the service? I know you're a patriot. <laughs> well, it's pretty tough. Uh, well, and the life is in, on the service is tough on families. Right. I had... Uh, all the problems, and uh, it's uh, tough on the kids and it's tough on the husband and wife. Right. What do you think? Uh, now you take regular people. That's people like yourself that stayed in and kept things rolling and kept things going. And and uh, what do you think motivates a lot of those people to do that? I'm, any... I'm not sure why they're staying in. I went to a uh, Navy pilot's reunion and I was sitting at a banquet table and there were four young guys and then there was two old guys in an empty seat. And I said, hey, boy, you've had one really good uh, tour of duty out there and what you accomplished and what you did. Uh, where do you go now? And they said, out. Rolling again. Oh, they're going to go out of the service. Well, that's, yeah, we're getting out. Three of them were pilots, and one of them was an intelligence officer. And uh, they just don't Were the pilots going to go to work for the airlines and stuff? Did they have high hours and stuff like that, or hours that they could do that? Or Well, I think they were going to do various and sundry yeah, different, different things. things. But, yeah, different things, yeah, okay. But I think uh, a trained pilot was all figured in there. You have 5,000 hours time. 5,500. 500 times. Uh -huh. yeah. And you you flew some aircraft that were armed with atomic weapons. You said that. I didn't say that. I just, I'm just i just asking people. Yeah, but maybe you I did. Had the maybe you did. I had the qualifications. To do it. Yeah, okay. Okay, well, that's... Okay. Uh, let's see. Now, did you get, uh, 
We know your rank was commander. We, uh, did you get any citations or awards or medals? Of course you did. Yes, but not too many. Uh, not very many, I should say, but I can... <clears throat> I, uh, I had the National Defense Service Medal, a Navy Unit Citation, a Naval Reserve Medal, World War II Victory Medal, American Theater, and Vietnam Service Medal. And I understand there's about three other medals I'm now qualified for. You can get, but they haven't got, you haven't gotten them, eh? I haven't put in for them yet. Okay. Uh, what what do you think were two or three of the things that occurred to you in the service that were memorable or frightening or things like that? <laughs> you know, as an instructor, I'm sure you must have had a few <laughs> a few close ones. Right? Well, uh, while I was training uh, night fighter pilots out in uh, uh, Hawaii at Barber's Point, which is near Pearl Harbor, I uh, we used to fly intercepts out there and continue to fly intercepts and the skies are beautiful during the daytime out there but when the sun goes down and then maybe there's a few stars around and but uh, that it is you've never seen anything quite so black out there and you have to fly instruments and so forth and uh, I used to get out there and I have to say Sam where's your courage you know you wanted to why did you join this Navy because I wanted to be a fighter pilot. So if you see me in a situation that's really bad, I still might end up saying fighter pilot, fighter pilot, fighter pilot. <laughs> Hanging in there tight. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, did you, were you, were you doing night training on carrier landings and stuff like that too? Yes. Were you? That's, that's considered fairly hazardous uh, activity, isn't it? Yeah, that's what I wanted to do when I joined, but I was, 17 years late getting uh, to fly aboard, and then I took five years to get off. I see. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm proud of it. Of yeah. what I well, did. we're proud of you, too. We're proud of all these guys we've been oh. interviewing. I mean, you, you can't believe the stories we hear. I mean, I, I know. Real hardship, real tough, you know. And the single, the thing, you know, just like you said one time during the interview, I had a lucky career. We hear that time and time again. I mean, uh, I think you make your own luck, but uh, nevertheless. Um, well, I always, we've always said, uh, if you're really going to be spectacular, a ramp strike cannot be beat. That's when they hit the ramp coming aboard and get too low and run into the back of the ship. Yeah, that's not good. Ruins your whole night. Sure does. <laughs> ramp strike. Huh? Uh huh. So, anything else I might? Well, we're going to have uh, uh, Sherry uh, here. Up here. And yeah. You get in there and it's sticking up there like that. Is that right in the... Okay, we have it on now. Okay, we uh, thought we'd go through a few uh, pictures here of the aircraft that uh, I was associated with. And uh, some that are highly interesting. This first one is a Stearman. When Almost every uh, Navy pilot, uh, Marine pilot, Air Force pilot, uh, or Air Corps pilot flew it in their, their program. And a uh, Stearman and its bi-wing prop. Here's another trainer, AT-6. And uh, Navy called it an SNJ, but it was the same airplane. This is the one that's down here on the bottom trainer and the next one is a uh, TBM a torpedo bomber by Martin and uh, it was a uh, developed after the uh, Battle of Midway and uh, anyway one of the interesting things was that uh, our ex-president Bush was a pilot and shot down in this out after he uh, attacked a Japanese submarine. And anyway, he was picked up by one of our submarines and returned to his ship and so forth, but that's very interesting. Uh, I got, excuse me, I have to take a peek here. And uh, AD, uh, a 
attack by Douglas, and uh, it was very interesting. And uh, an airplane that uh, in antiquity was still flying in Vietnam in uh, in 1972. Anyway, uh, it's uh, sometimes referred to as a Spad. A Spad was a World War One aircraft name, but this one is it had a nickname of Spad AD. Now here's an SBD Scout Bomber by Douglas, and uh, it was very prominently used for photo taking and for uh, the era when the Battle of Midway occurred. These guys carried the mail. Uh, we threw in one here, and this is a modified uh, A6, and. Uh, and anti-radiation uh, interceptor and can do most anything electronically that is another uh, TBM which we already looked at and uh, Here's an A-4, one of the, that's a very small aircraft. I believe there's some airplanes or some countries in South America that are still using this for a first line fighter. And uh, I think it was used in, by the uh, South Americans uh, during the fight over the Falcons. This is an F-14 uh, fighter, Navy modern day jet very capable and here's the uh, Douglas SBD 5 had these always had these little holes down along on the bottom behind uh, so they could dive straight down and keep from going too fast and uh, SBD Douglas Dauntless I've got time in that and here is a TBM again and one of the things that significant is it has a gun turret back here and a crewman here and a crewman here and one down in the in the belly as they would say okay here's a, a F by Grumman let's see F4 and they had to crank the wheels up and uh, here was an F6 and uh, so forth on down the line. Here's another AT6, North American. Here's a Catalina flying boat. And it was, um, could land on the shore in a regular runway. The wheels were retracted up in here, or they could land on the water. There's been a lot of people flown in those. Bill Williams was a pilot of the uh, Catalina. And the F6F5N, I flew this myself. So did Stan Gwensey here in the area around Sterling. Here's uh, the Stearman trainers again. Not sure. Oh, and um, F6, F5, another picture. And there are uh, here's uh, on the carrier, carrier avi aviation, which fascinated me all my life and always will. And there those guys are carrying the mail and the, some of these carriers that go out for uh, six months into the Far East. Uh, their air group make as many as uh, 10,000 arrested landings aboard ship. Uh, here's another AT-6. SNJ is what they call it, but it's an AT-6. And another uh, F-6F. And... Uh, 
there's enough uh, Grumman in here that uh, the pilots used to nickname it Grumman Ironworks because they could hang together so good. Here's another Douglas. Uh, this is a fighter that I flew in the Air Defense Command, stationed near uh, San Diego. And uh, then another F6, F5N. This one's a jet, two, two jets. This one is a one, one uh, prop. I think that kind of runs through some of the ones that were quickly available, and there are others, I'm sure, 